ZDDP is an 80 year old technology that requires updating with something that's new, better and improved. That's effectively the stated aim of a company called Neol Copper Technologies. I've been working with them over the last couple of years to validate the idea that a copper based anti wear additive can be as if not more effective than ZDDP while being also better for the environment. To get any technology like this out in the field, you basically need five stages. It involves formulating a product, running a small scale test, a large scale test, maybe a chassis dyno, and then progressing through to field trials. Now, so far, we've already completed the first three. And if you need videos about them, I'll link them in the playlist. So we've gone through the exercise of formulating a new lubricant with this new anti-wear additive. Now, it should be noted that the engine oil formulations that we're coming up with are drastically different to what you would typically see in uh, small and large engine oils. And notably, there is almost zero TBN and zero saps. We validated the idea by testing on a small motorcycle engine that was on an engine dyno. That was completed about uh, 18 months ago. And then we further validated it by taking a large Cummins diesel engine and testing that on a dyno as well. So what this video is about is the next step in that process, which is to take an entire vehicle, run it on a chassis dyno and see if we can obtain a lot of information about the potential benefits. So we strapped ourselves in, got ourselves a reputable location, which was attached to the University of Bath, filled up a Ford Transit with this beautiful green oil, of course it's green because of the copper, and commenced testing. Now, doing this with an organization like the University of Bath means that you have access to a whole bunch of information. Specifically, they were able to design us a test protocol which is going to ensure that we have very accurate, reliable data, but also data that is statistically significant. So for example, what do we have as the features here? Number one, thing like the air conditioning has a specific set point, so it is all climate controlled. So we're going to control for that. We're also going to have support for the wheel hubs. We are going to have a fan to replicate airflow over the car. We're also going to have an instrumentation tower that's going to be able to take in all of this data. In addition to that, we had vibration sensors set up for axial in all three directions, X, Y, and Z, as well as some emissions data coming out of the tailpipe as well. One thing that was really cool was to see the robot driver. So they actually have a robot inside that can shift gears that can, in a very controlled way, step on the gas or step on the brakes. And all of this, of course, is computer controlled so that we can replicate the exact same conditions over and over and over again to get a statistically significant sample of information. So let's remind ourselves of what we're trying to test here. So remember, the folks at Neo Copper Technologies have a theory which says that under reasonably heavy loads, but we have a process which is known as hydrogen wear. Now, this is not completely foreign to the tribological community. The idea of hydrogen wear has been around under various guises. I would say that in, you know, most commonly we're referring to it as white edge cracking. But the idea is that hydrogen can invade the surface of the metals. Um, hydrogen can come from the water in the oil or it can come from the hydrocarbons itself. And when it invades the metal surfaces, in particular iron, what it does is it sets up, sets up some stresses which as a result causes cracks to propagate towards the surface. Once those cracks have propagated, we get the formation of wear particles, right? And that is what is contributing to a significant amount of wear. The solution to this is this copper filming technology. The idea being that once we have the formation of a wear particle, these copper anti-wear additives are then able to sort of fill in the gaps and then smooth out the surface. Now, if this is true, we should see a range of benefits. So copper, you know, we see it in anti-seize products, for example, has very good friction characteristics. So we should see increases in efficiency. And we should also see reductions in vibration as that surface finish is smoothed out. Now, the reason why we're using copper is because on the reactivity series, the idea is that um, everything that is on the left, which is all the common metals that we would see in most formulations, they are more reactive and therefore susceptible to hydrogen wear. Everything on the right is a little bit more stable, but more expensive, right? So we don't want to use silver or gold. We want to use copper um, because this is going to be the most effective for the least amount of money. So what do we want to test as part of this exercise? Number one, we're going to test the amount of fuel consumed. And of course, we've got a whole bunch of meters to test fuel flow and make sure that that is all calibrated. 
So fuel consumption is probably the number one thing that we're looking at here. Number two, we're looking also at vibration. So I mentioned that we have the accelerometers that are attached to the car. They're going to measure a whole bunch of vibration data. Number three, we want to test for emissions, right? So fuel consumption and emissions should be you know, very, very closely linked. We also want to look at the oil condition um, because it's all well and good to prevent wear, but if the oil needs to be changed every thousand kilometers, then that's, that's no good. And finally, we also want to look at the engine condition, right? So we want to do a visual inspection afterwards through boroscope to verify that the engine looks really good. Okay, so now we need to set up some test parameters. And one of the things that was done by the University of Bath was to set up this test protocol. Some of you will recognize WLTC as being a very standardized way to test fuel consumption on vehicles. So the idea was that we had this test block, which enabled the vehicle to travel for about 400 kilometers. And then we also had another uh, block, which was referred to as the baseline. So we have uh, a whole bunch of data that we can collect over the course of what, 426 kilometers. So between the test block and the baseline, we have um, basically a procedure which is going to be very repeat repeatable. Now let's say we call this uh, TB and BS for test block and baseline. We're gonna repeat this a number of times. So for example, the vehicle came with um, some lubricant in it. So this was a used vehicle. It wasn't new off the lot. So it's already been run in and broken in. So we shouldn't expect to see any running in wear. Now we wanted to test against one of the major brands in the market, so selected a branded 0W30 and ran both the test block and the baseline data for the branded 0W30. After going through a bit of a flushing process, we're then gonna run it on the test block and the baseline on this new Neol 0W30. But that of course, it would not be enough data. We need to make this as repeatable as possible. So with the Neol, Neol 0W30, we are going to set up a number of test blocks and a number of baseline sets. And as a result, we can get very, very good repeatable data. Part of the reason we want to do this so many different times is because if the theory is correct that the, the copper anti-wear additive is going to form layers of copper on, um, in the asperities, then we, we need time to allow that to work. And what we would expect to see is improvement over time. And so it's important that over these test blocks, we're constantly measuring things like the emissions as well as the vibration data and the fuel consumption, expecting to see improvement. And then, uh, just there's a bit of icing on the cake, it's what would happen if we put this anti-wear additive in a gear oil as well, right? So now, the proof is in the pudding, right? So fuel consumption data, what does it look like? So the fuel consumption data is really interesting. So over almost 20 test blocks, this was the percentage improvement in fuel economy relative to the branded oil, right? And so what you can see is obviously there is a substantial amount of improvement. And once that copper filming starts to sort of stabilize, then you get a stabilization in the fuel economy improvement. If we looked at the numbers, um, once the, the economy improvement has stabilized, that came out to an average of 5.5% fuel economy improvement. And that's a really, really good sign, right? Now, as we've talked about on previous videos in this channel, there is a couple of different ways that we can obtain fuel economy improvements. One is changing the internal frictional characteristics of the base oil. That wasn't really done here because um, as you'll see from the oil analysis, things like the viscosity index and the type of base oils were mostly the same between the oils. The other thing that we can have is radical improvements as a result of the detergency of the oil if we have particularly dirty engines which are causing incomplete combustion. But in this instance, and you'll see it from the boroscope images, the inside of the engine was actually in pretty good nick when uh, the vehicle was received. So we can attribute quite a lot of this 5.5% improvement to the actual additive itself. Now you would expect to see this mirrored in the emissions improvement. So if we are reducing the amount of fuel that we burn, we would expect to see an equivalent reduction in the emissions. And thankfully, we do see validation of this because uh, under the WLTC cycle, and what we see in terms of carbon dioxide emissions is a 4.85% improvement, which of course is very similar to the 5.5% fuel economy improvement that we saw in that WLTC cycle. Now, what's interesting is that when you take a look at the X, Y, and Z data that comes off the accelerometers, we can see that in uh, three different conditions which were tested, so fourth gear, 5% in gradient, you can see that there are modest improvements to the uh, axial velocity average um, 
between the, the branded oil and the neol, right? You can also see it in third gear with a 10% gradient as well as sixth gear with a 5% gradient. So in all three conditions, we see statistically significant improvements. Now, how can we say it's statistically significant? Well, we were taking a huge amount of sample data. So, you know, accelerometers can basically uh, give you data every second if you want it. And remember, we're driving this thing over thousands and thousands of kilometers. So as a result, we have a very, very robust data set. So confirmation that what we're actually seeing is most likely a reduction in vibrations as a result of improvement in surface finish. Then it's important to also look at the oil analysis. So if you remember, the Neo branded oil looks significantly different to most of the major oils. Notably, there's no phosphorus, there's no zinc, and there's no real detergent to speak of. You know, notably in most engine oils, you'd see a combination of sort of calcium or magnesium detergents. There is obviously copper as a result of the anti-wear additive, and you usually see a little bit of boron. Now, boron could be a dispersant or it could be an antioxidant. It is one of those kind of multifunctional elements. Now, what's interesting is that when you then compare it at uh, both drains at 400 kilometers, right, what you can see is not a huge difference between the branded oil and the neol oil. If anything, there is a minor improvement in the iron levels. There's slightly lower levels of wear when using the neol oil versus the branded. So you can see there about halfway down, the branded oil after 400 kilometers had about 17 parts per million iron versus neol, which had about five parts per million. Now, one of the things that has been a question mark over the neol oil is how is it able to maintain a low acid number despite the fact that it has no TBN. So of course, TBN is total base number and that base is designed to neutralize the acids which form as a result of combustion as well as oxidation. And what you see is a high degree of very good acid control. So the actual oil itself leans acidic. So it starts off with an acid number in and around about two right? And by the time we finish almost 7,000 kilometers worth of driving, the acid number has really only increased, increased to about 2.5. So very good acid control, despite the fact that we don't have any overbase detergents in the formulation. Similarly with iron, right? The amount of wear remained relatively low over the course of the entire drain. So this is going up to uh, 7,000 kilometers. We only saw, I think, a peak value of about 24 parts per million. So quite low and that is an encouraging result. Not only that, but as you would expect, as you are laying down this copper film, you would expect that the more you use the oil, the lower the wear rate gets. And in fact, when it was, uh, we did an additional oil test on a second drain, what we saw that was that around about the 3000 kilometer mark, there was an, uh, a 50% reduction in the amount of wear relative to the first drain. And so again, that is a promising sign that that copper anti-wear additive is doing the exact job we wanted. Now, finally, you need to verify that the actual engine itself looks pretty good through a boroscope inspection. Um, a number of boroscope inspections were done, but on the top row, you can, can see the, the sort of the condition of the cylinders uh, when the vehicle were, was received. And, you know, hey, it's not too bad, all things considered. I've definitely seen some engines that are worse. Um, as a result, there's not a huge amount of cleanup to do, but you can see that in the lower three pictures, which is uh, after the Neol oil was used, we do see moderate improvement in uh, engine cleanliness. So overall, I would say that the results of this particular test, which mimic the real world, very, very encouraging and a, a really good sign that this oil formulation is headed in the right direction. Next step is field trials. So if you are a fleet owner, or a maintenance manager of a fleet, um, get in contact because um, I would love to see this stuff in the field sometime soon. I think it's worth addressing some of the comments or maybe even the criticisms that were leveled at previous videos. I had a lot of comments under the previous video that were saying something to the effect of, if it sounds too good to be true, then it must be. Now, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that, that view that uh, if something sounds too good to be true, you should kind of set yourself up for disappointment. At the same time, I feel like that's a little bit of a defeatist attitude. And really, technological progress happens uh, because things that are too good to be true or sound too good to be true end up actually being true. I mean, if you took me back 50 years and said, 
that one day um, I will have the computing power of the Saturn V rocket and I'll be able to hold it in my hand, I would say that sounds too good to be true. And yet here we are, everyone has smartphones now. So these kind of technological leaps, um, yes, they are rare, right? Um, but I also see them as a way for us to really push the industry forward.